Hello, and welcome to the online component of the ACES Critical Care Ultrasound course. My name is Andrew Cadell, and I'm a cardiologist and critical care physician at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Today's topic is regional wall motion abnormalities. Wall motion abnormalities are typically described by which segments they incur. For this, the American Society of Echo, or ASC, has divided the left ventricle into 17 segments, six at the basal level, six at the mid, four at the apical level, and then an apical cap. There are other ways of dividing the LV, depending on what background you come from, whether you're through critical care or through the emergency department, but they all effectively describe the same thing. Typically, when we're thinking about regional wall motion abnormalities, we're thinking about ischemia. The left ventricle is supplied by three large epicardial heart arteries, the LAD, circumflex, and RCA. The segment supplied by each artery varies according to the relative distribution of the heart arteries, whether they are right dominant with via the RCA or left dominant via the CERC, and the relative size of the LAD. That's demonstrated in the cartoon provided by the ASC, which shows uh, different segments and the different heart arteries that can supply them. The anterior wall, for instance, uh, is almost always supplied by the LAD, but the anterolateral wall can be supplied by either the circumflex or the LAD. Ischemia produces wall motion abnormalities within 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, these changes that can be seen on point of care ultrasound can be present before ischemic chest pain or EKG changes. The vast majority of patients who have uh, MI don't need real-time echo monitoring, but it can be helpful as an adjunct, particularly in a critical care setting um, for description of a shock state. In the parasternal long axis view, you can see two walls, the anterior septum, which is marked in red, and the infralateral, uh, also called the posterior wall, that's marked in blue. The anterior septum is supplied by the LAD, and the anterolateral is typically supplied by the RCA. The basal and mid, uh, which are labeled on the screen, refer to the level of, of the, uh, at the left ventricle. Dr. Buchanan from Alberta Sano has helpfully labeled the respective images in the following slides. In the parasternal short axis view, you can see all six of the uh, segments, or four that are labeled here. You can see the anterior marked in red, the inferior in blue, the lateral marked in green, and the slightly darker green marking the septum. And the lateral and septal can be uh, just uh, further broken down into whether it's anterolateral or inferolateral. Uh, this can be really helpful getting a bird's eye view or snapshot of all six of the segments. The one caveat here is you want to make sure that you're at the appropriate axis because you can very easily go from a mid to a basal or an apical uh, short axis if your uh, left ventricle isn't perfectly circular. The apical four chamber, you can see the anterolateral wall, which is typically supplied by the LAD or CERC the apex, which is almost always supplied by the LAD, and the inferior septum, which as you go up through the inferior septum apical, uh, towards the basal segment, it's increasingly supplied by the RCA. Although the apical two chamber isn't the most common uh, point of care um, uh, echo view to assess LV function, it is useful in terms of getting you a view of both the anterior and inferior walls. The anterior wall is typically supplied by the LAD, and the inferior wall is typically supplied by the RCA. The language uh, matters in terms of describing segments and segmental wall motion abnormalities. Typically, you can probably do a gradation of three different states. There's normal or hyperkinetic, which means it's functioning normal or contracting more than 50%. You can have mildly reduced, which is hypokinesis, which is variably defined as 30 or 50% thickening of the wall, or it can be severely reduced or severely abnormal. This would be an akinetic wall, which either has absent thickening or less than 10% thickening, depending on which source you use. You'll often see uh, the words like scar or thinning associated with that. And then there's disconnect, which is severely abnormal, an aneurysmal segment that moves outward during systole. Um, I think it's prudent to pause here and mention a couple of disclaimers. Regional wall motion abnormalities can be extremely hard to pick up. They require good command of basic POCUS echo assessment. They need good images which are on access with good endocardial definition. 
Sometimes a kinesis or dyskinesis can be clear, but subtle hypokinesis can be quite tricky to pick up. That's probably beyond the scope of a POCUS assessment, and you wouldn't really expect hypokinesis to contribute to a shock state. Not all regional law motion abnormalities can are acute ischemia. They can be sequelae of old ischemia. It can be secondary to a non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy, a sarcoidosis, an amyloidosis, a stress-induced cardiomyopathy. It can be myocarditis or a bundle branch block, or it can just be poor endocardial definition. And this is where you're going to really need to incorporate your other clinical clues, whether it's a physical exam, history, biomarkers, or previous imaging. Because if there was a wall motion abnormality that was present previously, it's likely that that is um, chronic ischemia or chronic other etiology as opposed to new ischemia. Moving into the cases, this is a 72-year-old gentleman with hypertension in the emergency department. He's intubated for respiratory distress. On assessment, he has cool extremities and he's reasonably hemodynamically unstable on moderate doses of levofed and vasopressin. Uh, you get out your, um, uh, your echo probe and you take a look at things. This is a parasternal long axis view. You can see that although the basal segments seem to be contracting reasonably well at the uh, anteroceptal and inferolateral segments. As you move out to the mid, there seems to be a bit of a hinge point where you're transitioning from a normal ventricle or thickening more than 50% to hypokinesis, probably getting towards akinesis. And you suspect there's probably a hinge point in the anterior septal wall about the mid segment that's mirrored on the inferior side where you're seeing a hinge point between the uh, mid um, and basal uh, inferior lateral wall there. Moving out to a four chamber, you're getting an even more pronounced wall motion abnormality. Once again, at the basal level, you suspect uh, that function is close to normal. But as you get out to the apex, there's no thickening. Although the heart muscle appears to be a normal thickness at rest, there's no uh, thickening during systole. And as an added Easter egg, you can see a large apical thrombus there. Not surprisingly, this patient was found to have a large anterior STEMI and went for PCI to the occluded LAD. In addition to usual management of acute myocardial infarction complicated by cardiogenic shock, he requires anticoagulation for LV thrombus. A second case is a relatively comorbid 52-year-old male with a known history of CAD. He has a witness out of hospital cardiac arrest and post ROSC, he's intubated and hemodynamically stable. He had the typical lactate peak that you get uh, post a hospital cardiac arrest, but it's come back to normal. And he's on very low dose vasopressors, peeing with a normal creatinine. This image stands in stark contrast to uh, the previous images that we looked at. Um, there is severe hypokinesis to akinesis of the entire anteroceptal wall. Beyond that, you can see that the myocardium seems thinner and there's a white streak that is represents old scar. Looking at the inferolateral wall, you can see the basal segment seems to contract. Well, it's probably borderline normal, but as you get out towards the apex, there's severe hypokinesis to akinesis. In addition, another clue to perhaps the longevity of this presentation is the left ventricle appears severely dilated. It's over twice the size of the atria and much, much bigger than the RV. And if you were to measure this, it would measure about eight centimeters in end diastole. Similarly, as we get out to a mid view, you can see that uh, probably the uh, inferior and inferior lateral wall uh, contracts best, but they're still probably at least mild to moderately hypokinetic, but the anterior wall is thinned akinetic. And this is mirrored as you get out to the uh, apical four chamber, which shows a severe reduction in LV systolic function. Although the actual ejection fraction is not as important in this particular example, it's probably between 10 to 15% with preserved RV function. In this particular case, given the patient's stability post ROS, there was felt to be no indication for cardiac catheterization. Uh, usual post ROS care, including normothermia for 40 hours, was pursued. And at, just prior to discharge, he had a cardiac catheterization, which showed the multivessel disease without any revascularization options. He was discharged home, neurologically intact, with a secondary prevention ICD.
Our third case is an 84-year-old female admitted to the uh, neurology service post-MCA stroke. As part of uh, routine blood work, a troponin was ordered and was elevated on the admission blood work. An EKG was ordered when her blood pressure dropped in the emergency department. Uh, being assigned to the race or the CCOT team, depending what the name is at your institution, you're asked to see her. Her EKG shows sinus rhythm with some anterior T-wave abnormalities. And as you go to uh, examine her, you bring your probe and you take a look at the LV. This is not a perfect parasternal long axis, so you can't draw too much inference. For instance, you probably shouldn't see the apex. It's kind of a hybrid of a three apical three chamber and a parasternal long axis. In any case, within those caveats, you can see at the basal level, you're seeing a hyperdynamic LV. Um, they're not exactly touching, but you can imagine a scenario uh, where they're contracting quite well and potentially could uh, obstruct if they were uh, contracting any more vigorously. However, as you get out towards the apex, you go from severe to uh, hypokinesis all the way to akinesis. Extending this out in the apical four chamber, once again, you can see the basal segments are hyperdynamic. As you get out to the mid and apex, there's almost no uh, contraction whatsoever. The RV function looks reasonably well preserved. In this particular scenario, there's two possibilities. Um, either they had LED infarct, and it's a big LED that stretches all the way around the apex and is able to uh, supply the septum, or what's more likely is they've had a stress-induced cardiomyopathy. In this particular case, because the serial troponins were flat, um, and the EKG didn't show any sort of gross ischemic changes, it was felt to be most likely a stress-induced or Takasubo cardiomyopathy. That being said, you can't really make that diagnosis without ruling out coronary disease, so cardiac catheterization was pursued, which didn't demonstrate any occlusive disease. She was managed with usual cardiogenic shock management, and at three months, she had recovery of her rejection fraction. The final case is case four, a 54-year-old gentleman with a long history of alcohol misuse. He came into the eMERGE in clear cardiogenic shock. His EKG showed China's tachycardia without obvious ischemic changes and serial troponins were negative. This is a very abnormal ventricle. Uh, you can see as you go along the anterior septum, it's severely hypokinetic to akinetic with almost no contraction or thickening. Similarly, as you look at the basal inferior lateral wall, it contracts reasonably well, but there's almost no contraction beyond that. This is a typical pattern that you've seen in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, global hypokinesis with regional variability. It really wouldn't fit a vascular pattern. And as you get out to the apical four chamber, you see something similar. The basal anterior lateral wall is contracting reasonably well, but the rest of the ventricle is severely hypokinetic to akinetic. This wouldn't necessarily fit within a vascular territory unless a patient had severe three vessel disease. In the current stem with no troponins and no ischemic EKG changes, that would seem to be less likely. This patient was treated as a non ischemic cardiomyopathy and stabilized with dibutamine and diuretic therapy, and this patient improved on subsequent echocardiograms. I think it's important to remember, however, you can't necessarily rule out uh, coronary artery disease just because there's global hypokinesis. Certainly, there could be stunning or severe three vessel disease that could be contributing. It would just be a little bit less likely. I'd like to thank all of you for listening to this talk. I'm looking forward to seeing you at London this year.